Welcome to the Leader Post Rider Rumblings podcast, episode number 147. Taylor Shire and uh, one of the newest inductees into the Regina Sports Hall of Fame alongside me, Daryl Davis. Congratulations on that honor, Daryl, uh, that you received uh, earlier this week. Thanks, Taylor. Uh, I'm not the first Leader Post sports writer, and hopefully I won't be the last to be inducted into the prestigious Regina Sports Hall of Fame. I'm really honored. Thank you. Well, very well deserved, of course. So let's get right into it, uh, talking about the Saskatchewan Rough Riders, of course, coming off that loss last week. It feels like a long time ago, but they lost 20-19 to to the Toronto Argonauts and now set for the annual Labor Day Classic this Sunday against the Winnipeg Blue Bombers. Before we look ahead at that game, let's go back to last week and and just give your thoughts maybe on uh, on the overall performance from the Rough Riders uh, last Thursday. Well, I still like the Rouge, by the way. I still think it's a great part of Canadian football. I know that that's a lot of uh, arguments have been started the last few weeks about it. Uh, the, the maddest people seem to be Rough Rider fans, but a lot of people don't like it anyway. The fact that the Rough Riders gave up that position, that field position late in the game, is is a flaw to the Rough Riders. They, they could have, with the ball back, at their own one yard line after a sack Taylor, they had 31 seconds left and could have found a way to run the entire clock down. And Corey Mason, his coaching staff really bots that one. Uh, you know, we've been pretty kind to them and he's of course learning the ropes as a, as a first year head coach. Uh, he hasn't had to deal with that situation obviously because he's a defensive coordinator it has been in the past, but they really could have run out that clock and bit the ball could have been punted in the air with zero time left on the clock and they could have still given up those 12 or 15 yard returned by Janarian Grant, and they would have been out of time. But instead, they they kicked it. They had a timeout, which was a botched play. Uh, they threw a long incompletion, which stopped the clock, and gave the ball back to uh, Toronto with enough time to run a play and then kick attempt a game winning field goal. They missed it, and it went for a single, which is how they won 20 to 19. It could have been 22 to 19, but uh, I think that. You know, when you looked at Corey Mace being quizzed afterwards, he was starting to think, well, maybe I did mess up. And he did mess up. They they were really responsible for not at least sending that game to overtime. There were a lot of other things that happened, but just that one series right at the end, Taylor, was really complicated, but I really think that they messed it up. Yeah, and I imagine Corey Mace looked at it, and, and, and yeah, we'll, we'll own up to that. But when, they, when Toronto kicked that – field goal to tie the game I feel like Saskatchewan was getting the ball back and thinking they were going to go kick a field goal to eventually win the game and I think Mace never really got away from that even after a what a, a 10 yard holding penalty on the return which pushed them back even farther then Harris got sacked which pushed them back even farther and I still feel like they were trying to go out and, and, and try to win the game on a field goal but when you're backed up so far you have to sort of admit that you're not going to get anywhere Harris made that nice incomplete or completion on seven or second down. Mace called the timeout. They were back again. So you still could have ran on that second down play, as you mentioned, even though they were in their own end zone. You never want to give up a safety. That would have been a, you know, we probably would have criticized them if they would have given up a safety on a, on a run play, right? So, yeah. Yeah, just I was a, thinking uh, no. just even a short pass, right? Yeah, uh, a really yeah. high percentage pass rather than one of those longer ones, the one downfield that they threw to Amelis, and Amelis was covered by four guys, so they they could have called it differently. Uh, you know, there, there's different ways. You're you're right that they, I'm sure they were thinking we'll march downfield and get this field goal. To Brett Lothar's credit, he was four for four after a horrible game the game before, right? He was three for seven and took all the blame as he rightfully should have and and moved on. Like some of those were barely inside the goalpost, but he was four for four and they had confidence back in him. So they thought that they could get in range. Um, they they did mess it up. Uh, and, and there were a couple of plays that, the, that they screwed up. At the end was the one that really stuck out in my mind. But also earlier in the game, on, on that that one fateful march you talked about, they were they had Toronto third and fifteen. All they had needed was a knockdown, you know, to to get the ball back and maybe kick it, that that game winning field goal. They dropped nine men into coverage, a prevent defense, three man rush. Prevent defense is a, the old joke, right? This prevents you from winning. Somehow Ungerer found the receiver found a soft spot in that in a nine man zone to pick up 17 yards and continue that drive. So a defense that had stopped them, stopped Toronto three times on third and goal from the one yard line, couldn't stop them on a third and 15. And that, that was flabbergasting to me. I, I don't know how, the, what, why, 
or how something like that happened. And there were little breakdowns. You always can point to three or four spots in the game that really, really turned the tide. And that was one of them as well. And it was a bad call and bad coverage. So they, they, there's another thing that went against them. Give them credit for stopping those short yardage plays. And C.J. Rivas, if he's not player of the week, I don't know if I've ever seen a defensive player have a more outstanding football game than he did last week. But uh, it ended up all for naught because they, they botched a couple of things. Yeah, he was all over the field. And, and part of at least two of those goal line stands, you know, you had a stop on uh, on second down and third down on that one goal line stand, I believe on third down on the one prior. But And Mace, Corey Mace talked about it after the game. That's sort of like a double-edged sword. You, you want to stop them on the goal line, but then you're, you're backed up. Your offense is starting in your own end zone. Trevor Harris threw two interceptions partially because of that. Obviously, they were ill-advised throws, but when you're starting that far back, it's sort of like you almost would have rather given up three points and, and on, on one or two of them and gotten better field position and, and started out at around the 30-yard line or whatever after after a kickoff or, or, or just after a scrimmage. So as much as the goal line stands are great, I don't really know if it benefited the, the offense, and, and, and he alluded to that post game. Yeah, and, and as you said, Trevor Harris threw two horrible interceptions at the first half that, that really, really kind of really hurt them because they were they had jumped into a 13 nothing lead. They racked up like 172 yards in offense by the halfway part of the point of the second quarter and were really in control of the football game. A road game once again on a short week to playing in an eastern city against a team that's coming off a bye. Everything was working against them, but they came out – on fire and you thought well good for them that's really impressive and maybe they faded in the fourth quarter that's probably worthy of a discussion as well but i think those two interceptions that trevor harris threw as you said from bad field position but they have to learn to work that way out of it sometimes maybe maybe in some stage you do uh give up a safety and get back some field position or something but that's the the league has put in rules to try to make that not as appealing either because safeties are pretty boring but sometimes it might be the safest bet for them and, and uh, would have gotten them out of the shadow of their own goalpost several times. But mm-hmm. you know, he makes a point that it's it's tough to move from there, but they are a CFL offense. They've got a veteran quarterback. They've got a pretty good offensive line, all things considered. They should have been able to work their way out of that predicament without throwing interceptions. And I do want to go back to the Rouge because I totally disagree. I, I, I don't like it. I've never really liked it. Um, I, the rouge on the or whatever, yeah, the rouge, the single point on a punt is 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 what it is. That's different and fine. But but when you miss a field goal and and Hyrule, who I think intentionally not not intentionally missed, but intentionally made sure that he got it through the back of the end zone. He mm-hmm. absolutely blasted that field goal. Um, was more worried about power than accuracy. Fine that he missed because it was going through the back no matter what. He wasn't going to be short and wide. He was going to be long and wide right and or or through right and, and as long and as he didn't he hit was. the goal post he, he was okay game, yeah. right yeah, yeah. if he would have hit the goal post that would have been quite the finish <laughs> off to overtime and and we would have debated that some more but um but i i don't like it because it i mean everyone says it rewards you for a miss and and he knew the rules of the game and he knew he was going to get it through the back of the end zone even if he did miss and and that's what he does but i i don't i've never really understood it on a on a missed field goal well, it's always because of field position, right? You, are you rewarding a team for getting field position? Yes, but you're also – the Rough Riders were punished for giving up bad field position at the end. Because the, the kicker missed and because they didn't score a touchdown, well, the consolation prize is kind of one point, which makes the CFL extra interesting. That's why I like it. You know, you never see a 4-1 four, four game in the, in the NFL because you don't get single points. I like the single point. Because it does create that little thing. When do you concede a single? When shouldn't you? When do you run it out of the end zone? It adds a whole new level of strategy. Did he just kick it through to miss? Well, maybe he did, but he made sure he kicked it far enough. And the riders let him get within that range. So by letting him get close enough to try that, then then they're giving up the single. That's, that's the punishment for giving up that field position that they shouldn't even have given up. They shouldn't even have given up the, the, the possession, basically. Mm-hmm. That short return could have ended for them. So... I don't have a problem with it. You know, I'm a proponent of moving goalposts to the end ends of the, the back of the end zone. I'm, I've always been a supporter of that. And if you do that, maybe let's talk about changing the Rouge point then uh, for missed field goals counting as a point. But right now, it's all in play. So let's keep it going the way it is. I like – so I like the conceding the single point. That's fine. Mm-hmm. When, when an offensive – when a returner has a chance to return it but elects to take a knee on a punt or 
a missed field goal. If you take a knee, I agree that should be a conceded point. But when you blast it through the back of the end zone and, and there's no chance of a return, especially in the last three minutes or last minute of the game, I feel like it just and it just gets rid of some of the drama that that could have been right. If if a returner is trying to return it out, but he's got you know, twelve guys barreling down on him, is he going to get out, or is or are they going to stop him for that single point? So there's a bunch of different changes and little alterations that I would make to the Rouge. Uh, overall, I don't think it should necessarily be gone, but I, I feel like it should always be conceded and not earned uh, by just blasting it through. Well, yeah, it, it, I know that it's it's a huge discussion point right at the moment, especially your your thought because that that was a total missed field goal, right? It wasn't short. It wasn't a, a long attempt that went that went a bit astray. He, he wanted to make sure it went out the back, but he was close enough to be able to do that. Uh, we haven't had a in a long time. We haven't had the old kick out play. I don't remember the last time we saw a kick out of the end zone play to prevent the single. Because what if that was, uh, you know, if uh, what if uh, Alfred had have caught the ball and it was short? Then is he going to punt it out or is he going to be able to run it out? So there's that drama that goes with it. But because the Riders had given up that field position, they didn't have to have to worry about that because the ball it was only a sixty yards straight through, right, forty yards from. Or thirty-eight, whatever, forty yards, I think, from the mm-hmm. uh, the line of scrimmage to the post, and another twenty through the end zone because they shortened the end zone a few years ago from twenty-five. So, it, uh, it it's been a part of the game forever and ever. It's what makes it unique. Should uh, are, are you going to just give it away for conceding? I don't think so. I think if you're close enough to kick it through the back of the end zone, or you're smart enough to kick it through the side of the end zone after it bounces through, they've started allowing them. That's a single point, and uh, I, I don't want to change it, but we can argue it forever, and I know there's people on both sides of this argument, and it's one of the things that makes the CFL fun to debate because it's it's a rule. We're talking about rules. We're not talking about suspended quarterbacks. We're not talking about com- the command center. We're talking about the rules of the game, and that's way more fun than some of that other stuff. I do agree with that. We're talking about uh, a, a pretty big matchup coming up in the Labor Day Classic. It's, it's crazy to think that this is going to be sort of a battle for top spot in the West division at this point in the season, after the start that it was for both Winnipeg and Saskatchewan riders started four and Winnipeg started zero and four. We were sort of saying, Oh, this is the demise of the blue bombers. They're going downhill. This is it. They're, they're, they're drought or their, their championship streak is, is going to be over. You know, the, everything is done for them. And all of a sudden they've climbed back up to the West division, uh, sitting in second place in the West division standings just behind Saskatchewan. And really first place will be on the line on Sunday. Yeah, is it Labor Day already? Where where's that season go? Sometimes you you think, oh, they're just getting started, then all of a sudden, whoop! This is when it really gets interesting, right? When the, they probably they sell out Mosaic Stadium, and and it's the the big bad hated Bombers who Saskatchewan fans, you're right, were gloating like crazy about being four and zero oh and zero oh and four Bombers, and uh, no, Winnipeg just kind of casually puts it back together, stays the course, right? Mike O'Shea stays with Zach Kalaros. Uh, they've gotten Kenny Lawler back, Brady Oliveira, their running back, is back healthy. Their defense is starting to understand what Jordan Younger, their new defensive coordinator, wants. Uh, and you just see them getting more and more reliable. They'll lose a game here and there. Everybody does. But they're not that weak team anymore. <laughs> like the entire West is, basically, right? Isn't it? That, to me, that's the funny part, how weak the West is in comparison into the East this year, which is a real turnabout from other plays. But uh, coming into Labor Day, I wasn't, you're right, the way the season started, I didn't think it was going to be such an important matchup, but it always is. And that's why the the, the wonderful part about Labor Day weekend. Yeah, and it really, I mean, the back-to-back, right? The Saskatchewan's going to have to travel to Winnipeg and it's going to be another two points on the line. Uh, so one team could be taking, we have to see what BC, Calgary, Edmonton do, but, but one team could be taking a bit of a stranglehold in the West Division if they somehow manage to go four, three, four, five points up on, on the other teams. And, and BC is also the riders haven't faced BC in quite a while. And, and Nathan Rourke is back. And, and I really thought when Nathan Rourke signed in BC that they would hit the ground running. Like they were that great team when Rourke, Rourke quarterbacked them a couple of years ago, but I mean, he hasn't looked uh, spectacular in, in the last two weeks and his first two starts and BC just keeps on losing. He did get better, though. He took a step forward. And, you know, he's he's been in an, an NFL state of mind for the last little while. So the, the evolution to get back to that is, has been different. When we looked at Chad Kelly coming in against for Toronto after a nine-game suspension, he hasn't had to learn new offenses. He's He's been, st- although he was suspended for nine games and two preseason games for, for his actions, uh, he was still able to study the Toronto 
playbook, watch their games and do things. He didn't have quite timing. And you saw him falter a little bit. And we thought that he might try too hard to prove be, prove himself because that's the type of guy he is. But uh, it seems like he is anyway. And uh, ended up passing for like 322 yards. I don't think he got a touchdown or didn't have a passing touchdown, did have one interception. So he wasn't horrible. He was he was well prepared. They have a pretty good team in Toronto, so uh, it 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 made it made quite a difference, right? The the fact that he's been training in Canada or at least planning, while Nathan Rourke isn't. And I think the BC Lions they do have a bit of a quarterback quandary on their hands in BC. Do you go back to Vernon Adams Jr. now, or do you who was hot before that and then injured, or do you stay with Nathan Rourke? I would think they're going to stay with Nathan Rourke, but uh, who knows? The good thing about Rick Campbell. Uh, the coach of the BC Lions, he'll probably tell everybody beforehand what he's doing and why he's doing it. Yeah, no, that's a good point. And it's, of course, it's a long season. We're into the second half, so there's lots of football to be played. But let's maybe go back. And I don't want to harp on the command center again. And and the Ryder, Ryder fans have no uh, – they can't argue with how the command center ruled because Kelly did have a touchdown pass that was called back. It was the right call. Um, I believe it was Coxie in the end zone, dropped the pass. And then there was Ryan Dinwiddie, the Argos head coach, challenged for pass interference. It was this long sort of delay, a couple of rulings. But uh, after the game, Dinwiddie did it, did say he didn't like the command center or or sort of uh, you know didn't like how that situation played out for his team. Hooray for Ryan Dinwiddie. <laughs> He's finally said what the coaches have been scared to say. It was the coaches who really wanted the command center, right? I remember Ken Austin 10 years ago with, when he was with Hamilton said, we'll get that low hanging fruit and make those obvious calls and get those out of the way and make sure that those are handled properly through the command center. They've just allowed the, you know, it's the same old argument. They've allowed the command center to take over the game. And now all it does is slow down the game, often getting the rulings wrong. You're right, Ryan Dinwiddie, the, the call that he asked for and that he was mad about, they got the call right on the command center, which is a rarity, I think, but uh, it hurt the the Toronto Argonauts, and now he's mad at the command center. And as he says, what do we have it for? All it's doing is slowing down games? Totally agree with him. If they could, they may as well just get rid of it now. For decades and decades and decades, with the game's been played by the, field, the players, the coaches, and the officials on the field. Why take it anywhere else? It's far more exciting. I was just at a Thunder game on the weekend, a Regina Thunder game. Flows along, man. You don't have to stop after every play. You hear the commentators now, oh, we'll have to see what the command center says. Well, we'll see what the command – you don't have that in junior football. I'm, I, it's getting to the point I would rather watch the university and junior games because you don't have to wait for that. If a team scores a touchdown and signal the touchdown, yay, let's go. Kick the convert and away we move. It's just so much better, so much smoother. And that's the way the game's supposed to be played. I, I'm so happy Ryan Dinwiddie finally spoke out, and I hope more coaches and general managers join him and the abolish the command center before uh, before the next year. I don't think that's going to happen, but you never. No, know. I don't think. They, you, I think you're win. right. I don't think it's going to. We can't go back again. They say, but I wish we could. Last week, uh, the CFL, I guess, issued. Uh, I forget what the word they called it. Uh, Clear and obvious. But they 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 issued a press release that basically said everything that was already in place. They were just going to reinforce some of the rules. And but they and now what, Taylor? Sorry to interrupt, but now what? Now you sit at a game watching it and you say, now when are they going to jump in? You know, they still jumped in a little bit, but it used to be they jumped in all the time. Now they jump in sometimes. Now you have no idea when they're going to jump in. And I think they've just probably made it worse because we're wondering, and I think that's what Dinwood, he's say, what he's expressing. When are they going to jump in? I don't know when. Maybe an obvious call, maybe not. They miss obvious calls. So... It's just added more confusion. Yeah, it is. Is I don't know. It, it, something needs to be changed, and, and I hope that it does. I don't know if maybe coaches need more challenges, and, and when a challenge is... Ooh. <laughs> you know, more challenges? So, so let me back up. Let me back okay. up. The command, the command center is not there to fix obvious mistakes. Coaches have, say, three challenges per game to fix obvious mistakes. So they have video review guys saying, hey, let's challenge this call. And, and if not, it's a 25-yard penalty if they oh, get it wrong or something like okay. that. Right. So, so the coaches can determine when and where they want to challenge. Um, maybe three is too many, maybe two a game. To get and if you get both right, mistakes. you get a third one maybe or something, right? Sure. Yeah. Okay. And if you get it wrong, it's the same as in NHL where you get a penalty in the NHL. Now, if you coach's challenge goes wrong, guy goes in the box and serves a two minute penalty. If a coach's challenge goes wrong in the CFL, you lose your time out. Well, so what you don't, right? Like it's not, you're not losing field position. So I feel like there should be a bit of a, an amendment where a coach, if he does get a challenge wrong, he's faced with a 25 yard penalty, 15 yard penalty, maybe. And then that challenge is now gone. Um, 
the command center doesn't step in throughout the game unless the coach challenges the call is how I think it is on okay. scoring plays, I could live on with that turnovers, yeah. on, on anything like that. You you get that challenge. And and I don't know. But then again, you're going to have the, the last play of the game. Your coach is going to challenge it because why not, right? Yeah, why not? you gotta you got a challenge left. Just throw the flag out. Well, so so there is a flaw in my thinking, but uh, but that is one way of maybe fixing it somehow. Mm-hmm. Just anything to get the command center out and off the playing surface. That's what I want. Anyway, let's uh, let's hope the command center doesn't have to step in too much uh, this weekend when the Riders host the Bombers in the annual Labor Day Classic on Sunday. It should be a good game, and uh, we'll be back next week for the Rider Rumblings podcast to discuss that matchup. Thanks, as always, for joining, Daryl. All right. Always nice seeing you, Taylor.